Welcome to Steppin' Out of Babylon, produced by Sue Supriano. Babylon is everywhere. It's the isms and schisms both in the system and within ourselves. Let's unify, stand aligned, and step out of Babylon. Hi, everybody. My name's Sue Supriano, and I'm really happy today to be interviewing Richard Moore. He's all the way here from Ireland, where he lives, and he's written this incredibly interesting, in my opinion, important book called Escaping the Matrix, How We the People Can Change the World. Richard worked uh, as a software designer for many, many years, and we've been talking, and he was telling me about how his mind was always working, trying to figure it out, and reading this book has made me know that he's done a very good job in figuring it out, and we're going to do a couple of interviews, so in this one, we're going to talk about what's been going on for the last millions of years. Where where, where do we want to start, Richard? Welcome. Well... I guess what we'd be talking about is the history of civilization, which is only about 6,000 years, a very recent development in human history. The history of civilization is really very simple. It's just the story of evolving hierarchy, ever larger hierarchies, uh, you know, starting with kings and then emperors and then big empires and bigger empires. Until today, finally, we have come to the point where one regime is on the verge of, you know, controlling the entire world as one empire. Uh, I mean, that's what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's what the Project for a New American Century is all about. So when you have a hierarchy, a hierarchy is always ruled by some elite at the top. Now, for most of the history of civilization, everyone would have agreed that we are ruled by elites. The divine right of kings, you know, there's no question about it. Uh, Your job was to find your place in society. But then about 200 years ago, they came up with this scam that they call democracy, which really was just an exchange of one set of elites for another. The new entrepreneurial class that um, were in tune with the Industrial Revolution wanted to take over power from the kings and aristocracies, the more inherited aristocratic kind of wealth. And so they came up with this thing they called democracy, which was really just a way to get ordinary people to fight the king's troops so that they could have a change of leadership. But it it isn't democracy, and it never was democracy. I'm sure some people must be, what, a scam? I don't know who's listening to this show, but uh, how can you call democracy this really important concept that we hold in the United States a scam? Well... James Madison, who is credited with being the architect of the Constitution, after the Constitution was written, then there was a big debate in the colonies over whether to adopt the Constitution or not. And so essays were published in the the newspapers, which later came to be called the Federalist Papers. And James Madison was one of the people who he would write why the Constitution is the way it is and why, why it should be adopted. And one of the things he said is that uh, there's always been those who have property and those who don't. And it should all, it's always going to be that way, and we've got to make sure it stays that way. So he basically explained how the Constitution was designed to prevent any kind of democratic movement um, from, let's say, changing the economic system or redistributing wealth or anything, make, making any real changes in how the system works. So it was designed to control us and to give the illusion of democracy, but it was not designed to be... Um, government of the people. You know, the the founding fathers tended to to refer to the ordinary people as the mob, and having them involved in governance was not what they meant by democracy. So from our point of view, the people of the world, it's it's just a scam. It's just one uh, set of elites taking over from another. And it's, you know, when we had good people, say somebody like JFK, then, you know, you might say, well, there's some reality to democracy. But now with, um, with Bush, and the way he's destroying the Constitution and starting wars all over the world, 
Uh, now it's pretty obvious that people at the top are making the decision with no public input. And look what happened to the, <laughs> this person you just re, you just referred to as being uh, having some democracy, JFK. Look what happened to him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm, which I'm sure you've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> so for 6,000 years, we've lived under elites, although at the present day, some people wouldn't agree with that. But according to my investigations, the work I've been doing, it, it's, it's pretty obvious. It's overdetermined, as they say. So that means that society has always followed elite agendas. I mean, wars have always been one elite wanting to capture territory from another to make, increase their hierarchy at the expense of some other hierarchy, or to totally conquer another country and bring that hierarchy under a bigger one. Mm -hmm. Consolidation of empire. So the ends which societies pursue right up to the present day are always the objectives, the agendas of elites. And the poor people do the fighting. Yeah, well, we do the fighting, we do the working. I mean, civilized man is really synonymous with domesticated man. I mean, we are domesticated the same way. Cattle and sheep are domesticated, and we have our roles in the games we're allowed to play. But we have no more say in what society does than the cattle do. Now, uh, we've put up with this for 6,000 years, but it's gotten to the point now where we, we can't really afford it anymore because the earth itself is being destroyed. Our life support system is being destroyed. And um, the time has finally come where we can no longer afford to allow elites to run society. We have to actually create, for the first time, a really democratic society, which means a society which is governed by the people themselves for the benefit of people. Because it's only, the people, it's only us, we the people, who care about our welfare. To the ones who run society, if there's a depression or if a bunch of people die from starvation, well, so what? That's happened before in history. Just They just own more when, it's, when the dust clears. So the only way we're going to turn the ship of state around is by creating a democratic society. Well, b before we get into how uh, we're going to uh, create a democratic society, which you certainly write about in your book, Escaping the Matrix, Richard Moore, I would like, if you're willing, for you to uh, go a little more into what's going on in in the United States, or maybe, you know, starting with the 20th century. That is the first third of your book or so. You cover a lot of ground in less than 100 pages. And basically, as I understand it, what you're saying is the bankers rule the world and behind the scenes, behind, behind, determine most of the policies. And it's some pretty intense stuff that you say, which I have been learning about more and more. You have uh, covered a lot of it in a few very readable pages. And um, if you're willing, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that and also about what you mean by escaping the matrix. Yeah. Um, well, it comes from the film, The Matrix. And I thought the, the film was, was rather special in the way that the, way they, the science fiction story where the uh, actual reality was so different than what we thought reality was. Like for me, when that when that scene came where Neo takes the red pill and then the, the mirror starts to undulate and then suddenly he's in this totally other world, it was just an amazing metaphor for how different reality can be from what we think is going on. So it's, I'm just borrowing that one concept from the film. It's not that the book has anything to do with the film. Mm -hmm. Because to me, as the more I learned about history, the more I learned about politics and the, the way things really work in the world, it just became clear that uh, the way things actually work is, is so totally different than what you would think if you just watched the 6 o'clock news, that it's like two different worlds, just, just like in the film. Uh, they're not even related, hardly. And so in the book, I'm not trying to give a, a comprehensive history. I'm not a historian. I was trying to just pick some of the more dramatic episodes that are well-documented from history that are kind of shocking, that are just very different than what we've learned, and yet very central to what, what's happened in the world in the last hundred years or so. And so it was really just to show that real history is different than reality, mm -hmm. and then get on with the rest of the book. And that's not a comprehensive history. Well, I didn't mean to say that it's comprehensive, but in terms of 
talking about who rules the world, as I have come to understand a lot of the same things, although not as, as well as you do, because I couldn't write about them. But uh, especially since 9-11, my eyes have been opened, mm-hmm. and I say this to many people. I've been an activist uh, for peace and justice for many, many years. Mm-hmm. But since 9-11, uh, the world changed for me in that I see how much is orchestrated by the powers that be, how much that we see in one way and, and look at it, we being the large we, the mm-hmm. people of the, the world and of this country anyway. See a certain way really is an, is another way and has been orchestrated by these particular groups of, I imagine, mostly men, mostly white men, I imagine, behind the scenes. Uh, names of these groups, like the Council on Foreign Relations, mm-hmm. um, you could name some more, are not household words, mm-hmm. but they're the ones that are making... Uh, the policies and decisions and determining the directions in which things in, yeah, in which things go. Now, we don't want to overwhelm people with too much information here, but if you could say a little bit about that, fill in a little bit of how things are not as they seem, I would appreciate that. Yeah. Well, one of the examples that I use in the book in which I, I got really from a fellow named William Engdahl, who wrote A Century of War, um, Anglo-American oil politics and the politics of oil, something like that. I mean, there are a lot of sources, but he, he did such a good job that I kind of borrowed uh, a lot of his uh, stories for my first chapter. And so World War I, basically uh, what we learn in the history books is that, oh, there were these unfortunate entangling alliances and there were misunderstandings and, and the nations of Europe got dragged into war without really knowing how it happened. You know, sort of a a vague story. Um, In fact, what was going on is that Britain, which still was the big empire of the world, still ruled the waves and was recognized as the most powerful nation still before World War I, um, really had been in decline in terms of industry. And uh, Germany had overtaken it in terms of manufacture and new new products, things like that. And Germany was building a rail network, and they were going to build a rail network all the way down to Baghdad. It was going to be the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. So with this rail network really covering Europe and Western Asia and their own source of oil and greater productivity, uh, industrial growth and all, uh, Germany was set to really eclipse Britain as, uh, you know, an economic power. Um, Germany wasn't out to conquer. It was just expanding uh, as other nations had done and it was going to overtake Britain just like China is kind of overtaking the United States now so Britain just decided you know covertly <laughs> you know in their intelligence circles and the top elite and uh, you know got together and uh, basically made a plan to start a war and so they carefully created alliances uh, with all of Germany's uh, neighbors and among themselves, among all the parties, so that once some kind of a a battle started somewhere, then it would automatically become a war between Germany and all of its neighbors. And that's what happened. And it wasn't an accident at all. It was was a plan for Britain to maintain its, uh, you know, level of hegemony. And actually, when the war was going on, while the French and Germans were fighting it out in the trenches, uh, the British sent a million troops to the Middle East to capture oil fields. Mm-hmm. So oil has been big part of the story for quite a while here, too. I mean, more people are aware of it now. But that's right. And that's one of the th- points that Engdahl emphasizes, which, again, that I emphasize in my book in that section, um, is that just about just a little bit before World War I, when the importance of oil became clear uh, to everyone, a strategy was formed. Uh, originally just by the British and then later adopted by America, was that the way to control the world is you control the oil sources and you control the, the trading networks and the brokerage, you know, the, the buying and selling of oil. Uh, and if you do that, then you control global finance. And if you control global finance, then you really control the world. So that uh, even after Britain had declined... Uh, industrially, they still maintain their power by changing interest rates, for instance, that would 
uh, or the availability of credit that could make or break the industry somewhere in the Far East, you know, that kind of thing, because uh, London controlled banking. So they saw banking and oil together were the way you could really have a stranglehold on the world. Well, so World War I started as a, really a plot by Britain to keep Germany from uh, growing anymore. At the end of World War I, it turns out that uh, Britain and the rest of the Allies were all in astronomical debt to J.P. Morgan because it was American funding uh, brokered through J.P. Morgan which allowed the war to be carried out. Britain didn't have enough money to fight, to fight a war against Germany when, when the war started. So uh, the British bankers worked with the American bankers prior to the war to create the Federal Reserve System because that was needed in order for the scale of funding to be possible uh, to support the war effort. So all of that was orchestrated. And at the end of World War I, then, all this money was owed to J.P. Morgan and the people he had arranged to get the funding from. And so the, all those um, repara- what they call the reparations regime after World War I, where all the nations were basically strangled and couldn't develop because they were paying off these huge debts, especially Germany, that was all engineered by J.P. Morgan as a way of getting his loans back. Whereas when you read in the history books, they'll say, oh, it's the, the uh, personalities of Clemenceau and Wilson and how those personalities played together and they, they made mistakes and we had this reparations regime. It wasn't that at all. Mm-hmm. It was just what the bankers set up to get their, their money back. Well, I guess the history books are part of the, what creates uh, this other reality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, what you call the, the matrix. Exactly. I mean, like, you know, you read the newspaper and you see all these lies told by Bush and, um, you know, the propaganda, constant propaganda the government uses to support its position. Well, that basically becomes the de facto history. Then, because when people are writing history books, they go back and they read the New York Times or whatever sources they look at. And uh, so, well, that's what happened then. They write it down and it's history. So, the matrix is kind of the accumulation or the accretion <laughs> of past lies. Um, and it all it's it all makes sense. I mean, you 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 need, want to control a population, you need to give them a story about how they have the greatest nation, or you know, or the they're living in a democracy, and their nation they're out there get, bringing freedom to other peoples. You need to tell these stories in order for people to go along with the plans. Well, Richard Moore, maybe we could move the, uh, up a little more toward the present because I know and. Um, Probably some of the listeners know also have heard that Bush's grandfather uh, supported the Nazis. You know, so that's the Second World War. You want to say a couple words about that? Well, and- there's a transition between those because in trying to collect the money after World War I, it turns out that people like Mussolini and Hitler were able to have an iron grip over their nations. And one of the things they both promised was to pay off their war debts. And so they were both funded from the West, from these same bankers, from, you know, America. I mean, um, Henry Ford's picture was on Hitler's desk all through the time he was in prison when he was writing Mein Kampf, because Henry Ford was kind of one of his heroes. Um, There were American uh, manufacturing, Ford, General Motors, Grumman, all kinds of American companies were operating in Germany throughout the war, uh, manufacturing weapons which were used against American troops. There were times when uh, uh, oil or ball bearings or certain supplies were needed by both sides, and they would be rooted to the Nazis instead of to the American troops. Because what was really going on in Europe in World War II was really a joint venture between the United States and Germany to devastate the Soviet Union, which was nobody likes socialism and communism. There were no American and British troops in European soil until after the Russians had turned the tide against the Germans and were driving them back toward Berlin. That's when D-Day and landings in Italy happened. So there was collaboration all through the war, and Prescott Bush was uh, one of the main people to handle Nazi finances. I think he was the sort of the American banker in connection for Nazi Germany handling their funds. And um, FDR actually had to confiscate some of... Uh, some of Prescott Bush's companies under the Trading with the Enemy Act. And so there's a direct linear connection from Prescott Bush through the Bushes. I mean, it's really, they're really rebuilding the Nazi regime. I mean, 9-11 was just a replay of the Reichstag fire. The, even the names they're using for like Homeland Security, like a lot of these laws are just 
a pattern directly on the Nazis. And they used to say enemy of the Reich. And here we say enemy combatant. You know, but it's, it's like just a transliteration from the German, kind of the same ideas. It's just uh, not just uh, analogous. It's really the same program. Mm -hmm. And would you say a little bit more about what, what the bankers are doing? And, uh, well, we, what, you had three things, uh, finance, oil, and intelligence. Is that the third thing? Well, I'm just saying that the oil and finance together are kind of the, the way to control the world. I mean, the IMF is kind of what used to be the Bank of London, you know. International Monetary <laughs> Fund, which lends money. Uh, you, we just can't assume everybody knows what oh, these initials mean. Sure. Probably a lot of people do, and some people don't. But anyway, they lend money with a lot of strings attached <laughs> to uh, countries. Yeah, so, th I mean, the IMF, the World Bank, um, these institutions were set up really to uh, handle finances on a global basis, controlled mainly by the United States and Britain. Um, sort of an extension of their banking systems. Mm -hmm. You said something about England and the United States now, about if anybody was wondering why uh, Blair and Bush work so closely together that the history oh. explained it, and what it, I, I would like you to share that with the audience, if you would. Well, um, so Britain had this strategy of oil-based dominance, and the United States uh, pretty much picked up on that strategy from Britain. And after World War I, there was a lot of competition between Britain and the United States over getting the, the most oil sources. And Britain, was, for its size, was doing pretty damn well. I mean, they had, at one point, they had a whole lot of Latin American sources under their belt. And uh, so finally, they came to an agreement, which I know you, some people call it the Seven Sisters Agreement. But basically, they came to this was in, what, 19, oh, was it around 28 or so? I forget, somewhere in that region. They came to an agreement where basically the, you had the seven major oil companies. They kind of agreed on what their territories were, and this is kind of where we get our oil. This is kind of where we market our oil and, and uh, kind of agree on prices. Uh, so they set up a collaborative scheme for exploiting the oil industry, a cartel. Um, and basically, and it, it was heavily British and American. I'm not saying there weren't investors from, there's other European bankers and European vet that are wealthy as well, but it, it's basically an Anglo-American operation, and it's still going. So Britain and the United States are still in a partnership agreement about controlling the world, even though Britain's much smaller. It's managed, it's leveraged its position very well. In so, running a one-world government. So you can, so when you, when you read about um, whether or not the Britain is going to go onto the euro, and you listen to the arguments Tony Blair gives to the British people, it's also parochial because what it's really about is the City of London is is a very important world banking institution along with American banks, and the, having control of their currency, the pound, is essential to that. There's no way they're going to go to the euro. So you, when you have a longer range view of things, then you, you just kind of laugh at some of the things the politicians say because Blair doesn't have any say in it. It's the bankers who decide whether they go to the euro, whether they keep the pound. Well, uh, I'm sorry to say we're just about out of time, and I really wanted you to say something about the uh, world government, uh, Richard Moore, and then I want to let people know that we're going to get into the second part of uh, your book here in another interview, and your book is called Escaping the Matrix, How We the People Can Change the World. But if you would just say a little bit about this uh, one world government coming up because I it's been very confusing to me and your book elucidated for me. Well, um, there's our representative in the UN. He's there trying to push through a program of reform, and what they mean by reform is to turn the UN into more of a centralized organization where the Secretary General has a lot more power. And um, so, like a lot of the right wingers have been saying this for a long time that the UN was going to be a way to take away American sovereignty. And I always kind of laughed at it because the UN, you know, was, was kind of a, a thorn in the U.S. society. It was kind of too democratic. It was always going for too many liberal reforms, and America wasn't liking the UN. So I thought the right-wingers were being paranoid. But the, what they're doing is transforming the UN into something, into something which is really an extension of American foreign policy. And so the, the right-wingers were, were right all along on this one. The, the UN is really a, a vehicle to create a world government, take sovereignty away, uh, well, 
groups from all nations, an extension of globalization, really. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, of course, why it has been so confusing to me, because I thought the same thing. The United States wasn't supporting the U.N., wouldn't get, pay their money and all this kind of thing, and then all of a sudden they want it to be. So there's a lot of things that are confusing, and uh, we want to escape the matrix. <laughs> and we're, we, we're going to hear more about that, so stay tuned for the next interview. And uh, I want to let you know that the website... And, Richard Moore, you've been doing this website for 10 years, is it? Well, I've, I have two websites, cyberjournal.org, which is my email list I, and website I've had for 10 years, and then escapingthematrix.org is the one for the book. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a lot of discussion, and you have a blog. Well, they d I have an email list where I publish things. Uh, and then people write back in, and then every once in a while I come put together what people have written and, and publish that back out. So it's more like a newspaper. It's be, I've had it be, when they didn't have blogs, mm -hmm. you know, sort of older than a blog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can live uh, in Ireland and be talking to people all over the world. <laughs> I guess you could live in Eugene, Oregon, where we're having this conversation and talk to people all over the world. I don't guess, of course. <laughs> I, know, I know you could because <laughs> that's well, what's happening right now. It's a beautiful place, <laughs> beautiful place here. Yeah, I really like Eugene. Oh, good. And um, are people aware of the kinds of things that you're talking about um, in Europe, do you find? Well, I, I, I find that the average person, uh, in Ireland anyway, is, seems much more savvy of what's going on. Just an average person you would talk to in a pub or something just uh, has done a lot of thinking themselves about things and just has kind of an intuitive... I guess because the Irish government is so obviously corrupt... Uh, it's just taken as a way of life in Ireland that things are corrupt. Um, so they naturally kind of interpret it that that goes all the way up the tree pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of Americans just have a very idealistic, rose-colored glasses on view of so many things in the world. Well, I guess the Matrix is working better here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for this interview. And... Uh, People can uh, check out your website, escapingthematrix.org, or get your book and tune in for the next part of this conversation, which is going to focus on how we, the people, can change the world. Uh, so thank you very much, Richard Moore. My name's Sue Supriano. Thanks for listening. To hear other programs produced by Sue Supriano, go to my website, www.suesupriano.com, spelled S-U-E-S-U-P-R-I-A-N-O. To order copies of my shows or to communicate with me, you can send me an email at sue at suesupriano.com. Again, Supriano is S-U-P-R-I-A-N-O. Thanks a lot. Welcome to Steppin' Out of Babylon, produced by Sue Supriano. Babylon is everywhere. It's the isms and schisms both in the system and within ourselves. Let's unify, stand aligned, and step out of Babylon. Hi, everybody. My name's Sue Supriano, and my guest today is Richard Moore. Richard Moore is the author of Escaping the Matrix, How We the People Can Change the World. And he's been writing for the last 10 years or more um, and worked for many years in the computer industry. And now he lives in Ireland, although he's from California. And right now we're in Eugene, Oregon. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to interview Richard Moore. I've only read half of this book, The Bad News. <laughs> and we did that in, in interview number one. Now we're on to how we, the people, can change the world. And maybe we should just 
put a little description of where we're at <laughs> before we talk about what we want to change. Just a, a little short one, if you would, Richard, how you see. And I know you could go into sure. lots and lots of details, but we don't have time for those, and some people can check the other one. Well, our civilization today is like a ship that's steaming downstream, full steam ahead, uh, toward a waterfall, where it's going to go over the waterfall. And whether you talk about global warming or acid rain or uh, losing our topsoil or the fish dying or however you look at it, you can see the world is like headed for a major disaster like we really haven't had before, at least for many hundreds of years. And uh, the only way that humanity can be saved <laughs> or the world can be saved is to turn the ship entirely around and steam the other direction. Uh, in other words, we need to totally transform society. Just trying to reform some things or get some new policies or vote in different people isn't going to help. We've got, we need a totally new kind of economy, a to totally new kind of society. Uh, we need that just to survive. Yep. Uh, do you want to say something uh, real quick about the Matrix? I guess uh, uh, the name of your book is Escaping the Matrix. So um, a lot of people know that film, but some people don't. Escaping the Matrix, it comes from the metaphor in the film, and it's just saying that uh, kind of our normal view of history, our normal view of what's going on in the world is quite unlike what's really going on behind the scenes by the people that are, what are, what are the real goals in Iraq? What are the real goals in Afghanistan? Uh, why is the United States doing all these anti-missile de defense systems? What is the real reason versus what is the matrix reason? Right. What is the real reason? You were just talking about global warming uh, and gl uh, climate change. And I always throw in peak oil, oil's running out. Why is the government destroying the safety net, uh, basically shredding the Constitution? And there's a lot of whys. Mm -hmm. So th the fact is that that is what's happening. So those are all examples of the ship heading toward the waterfall. Right. Yeah. So. How do we turn it around? So for 6,000 years, we've been ruled by elites in one form or another. In fact, I'd like to read a quote here from uh, Francis Moore LaPay. He said, we've lived so long under the spell of hierarchy, from god kings to feudal lords to party bosses, that only recently have we awakened to see not only that regular citizens have the capacity for self-governance, but that without their engagement, our huge global crisis cannot be addressed. The changes needed for human society simply to survive, let alone thrive, are so profound that the only way we will move toward them is if we ourselves, regular citizens, feel meaningful ownership of solutions through direct engagement. Our problems are too big, interrelated, and pervasive to yield to directives from on high. And that was Francis Moore LaPay in Time for Progressives to Grow Up. Mm -hmm. And she's written many other books, the titles of which I can't think of right now, but the first one was about food. She's really famous for that one, and she started an yeah, organization diet. called the Diet for a Small Planet. And she started Food First, and um, I've interviewed her uh, several times. And that's a great uh, quote, mm -hmm. and it's certainly in contrast uh, to how many people say, but we can't do anything. I can't tell you how many people I talk to say that. But what can we do? There's nothing we can do when I'm talking about whatever, yeah. any of those issues. Mm -hmm. Well, they're absolutely right. There is nothing we can do within the current system. Our whole economic system, our whole capitalist system is all directed toward uh, economic growth, which is incompatible with the finite earth. You can't grow forever in a finite earth. It's just that simple. Can't make it any plainer. And um, our political system then is set up so that we can't affect anything. It's 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 set up to divide us from one another. Uh, we choose sides, we Republicans or Democrats, and then and then uh, no decisions are made by us. We just choose which uh, brand of elite should be in charge. So. We, we can't change anything within the current system. The only thing we can do is change the system. Mm -hmm. And to change the system, we need to create a democratic society. But we don't even know what a democratic society is. I mean, what it, me what it means is that we learn, need to learn how to govern ourselves. And we don't have any experience at that. 
Now, governing ourselves is really the same as learning to work together, learning to communicate with each other, learning to make decisions together. And we don't know how to do that. If we, if we try to have a meeting, like a town hall meeting or something, you know what happens. There's a few people that dominate and people shout and they argue and nobody agrees on anything. And people start going home and then you delegate to a committee. And that's just, committee is just another word for hierarchy. It's another word for delegating to somebody else to make your decisions for you. Mm-hmm. Now, so democracy is about learning to talk, learning to communicate with each other in new ways, ways that are effective, ways that allow people who disagree with each other, have different interests, to nonetheless um, dialogue creatively and collaboratively and solve problems together. Now, that sounds like something that can't happen or isn't possible or is already utopian. Oh, I thought you were going to say it sounds like something that shouldn't be so hard. <laughs> well, if you have any experience with group processes and facilitation and things like that, then you know it isn't hard. But it's, it's not known in our culture very widely. It's known in circles of people that do facilitating and counseling and mediation and things like that, and their clients, which are often are uh, corporations, you know, to make their teams better internally. But it turns out that the, quote, technology of facilitation is very advanced and it works and it's used all the time and I could say the following is that if you can take almost any 12 random people from a community and if they are together for two or three days of uh, dialogue with a facilitator they will come out the other end with almost like hugging and having a uh, emotional experience of bonding at the level of finding that they can understand each other they can work together they can actually solve problems creatively together when they thought at the beginning they were enemies. And kind of the way it works is that at the beginning when there's all the arguing going on, people are just, they're thinking in terms of their positions and what they want to accomplish. And they see the other people as just people with a, uh, beings with other positions that need to be argued against. Okay, But when people are enabled to really listen to each other, which is the facilitator's job. Facilitator is not someone who pushes through an agenda or tells you what to talk about next. I'm talking about a facilitator who simply makes sure people hear each other. Yeah, listen is, here is a key, are the key words that yeah. are missing in so many communications that are part of this culture. It's becoming part of this culture not to hear. I think it's, it, it's, it hasn't always been this way. Mm-hmm. I'm really noticing that it's getting quite extreme. I don't know if it's a self-protective kind of uh, dynamic or what it is. It's scary to me. It is. Well, yeah, the increasing polarization at the current time, yes. But even before that, even even just... That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying they don't hear, like you didn't say a word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and more than that, too. I mean, and, and certainly even if they if they hear sound, it, don't, it doesn't sink in the meaning. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's what I mean. Right. Now, but with the right kind of facilitation, it's people who are, who are at opposite ends of the spectrum can actually learn to hear each other and learn to respect each other. And uh, I can give some more examples of this. But let, but let me continue with kind of what happens in a dialogue session, is that when people begin to realize that there's other people in the room, and, and gee, gee I, have ch- I have children, and they have children, and I'm worried about school, and they're worried about school, and, and the, the common everyday things we have in common you realize these are, these are real people like me that have real common everyday problems, and you start to respect them as people, then a shift happens. Then instead of hearing them having a position that's different than your position, what you hear is here, here's a person, a valid person, who has concerns. And I have concerns, and everybody in the room here has concerns. And, and yet we're all real people. I know them now, and I have some respect for them. So the problem then becomes a collective problem in the room of how are we together going to come up with solutions that meet all of our concerns. So it becomes a collaborative endeavor instead of a competitive endeavor. And that is possible, and it happens almost every time with ordinary people if they stick with it and if they have a facilitator that helps them listen. Mm -hmm. So that process, I call that a harmonization process, where people come in playing different tunes, and they kind of get their guitars all, you know, sort of in the same key, and they begin to harmonize and collaborate. Mm-hmm. And it's a very special thing that that can happen, but it can. And it's been demonstrated over and over again. 
-hmm. that it really works. Well, I agree with you, and I've seen it, um, and it's happened to me. <laughs> um, and I, I'm just thinking that, well, first of all, most groups, unfortunately, don't have facilitators. And I mean, and I, and I agree, it would really make a difference if they did. First of all, people have to even want to do that. Second of all, they have to have time to kind of settle down and do it. And in this world where things are moving so fast and people are so busy, which, which is a huge issue for just about everybody. They're kind of like stretched already. So what do you think about that? I mean, is this just, well, it would be nice if everyone had a facilitator and they agreed to this. Or I mean, but that's not the way it is. So what do we do next? Well, I mean, we could get a some some groups could get a facilitator, but I do you have any broader way that you address this issue of how we the people can change the world? Yeah, so that's kind of the starting point is the realization that a small group of people with a facilitator can reliably achieve a kind of dialogue that we're not accustomed to. Now, when I learned that, that was it was it was like a breakthrough for me to even know it was possible. It was like learning about nuclear power. So oh, I didn't know you could have that kind of power, you know what I mean? And so it was a breakthrough concept. And then what I've been working, what I was then was working on for the next year after I've learned about that was how could that help us create a democratic society? And it's not so simple as saying that every time people get together they should always have a facilitator and then everything's going to be fine. It's, it's not like that. So the concept that I've come to, partly through things that have been tried and partly through just kind of extrapolating what might be possible, is to have the kind of dialogue process I described with random citizens from a community and then to repeat that, sort of bring in a different jury, as it were, a different 12 people, uh, and sort of every month, say, for six months, have these kind of processes in the community and make the results known to the community and after each session, have a public meeting where you report uh, what happened at the dialogue session. And the, the idea of what could happen there is that what would emerge from these dialogue processes would be an emerging sense of the community, it's a sense of the community. Because um, when I say that these people are selected randomly to participate, so they become like a microcosm. So the, most of the interests or the different special interests and the youth and the older people, whatever, in a community would tend to be represented in one of these processes. Mm -hmm. So when they reach that point of uh, respecting each other and harmonizing their interests and their concerns, the results they come up with are very likely to find resonance in the community generally. And the community is probably going to get kind of excited about these good ideas coming out of this process. I'm actually remembering now an interview I did with Laura Wells, who was it? It's a, something like that. I think it was in Vancouver. She's from the Bay Area in California, and she said it was really wonderful, actually. But uh, but I know it's unusual to happen now. So this is a good thing to keep in mind what you're talking about when and if things change a lot. Because in my opinion, relocalization is really important. I think that not having cheap oil and transportation and with, you know, possible emergencies and all this kind of thing, that we just, we, we're going to be forced to not be traveling around so much and everything and not moving and, you know, we'll be where we are. And anyway, it's a good idea because this is such a huge country. And if you're talking about this top down, this, you know, history of being ruled by elites, one way to take power back is to be talking uh, to people more close to us, more actually physically close to us. Well, relocalization makes just as much sense from a political point of view as it does from an economic point of view. And my belief is that a democratic process is only possible on the small scale. Mm -hmm. And if I had to pick a number, I'd say about 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. That is small. You get a sort of neighborhood size, small community size, 3,000 people or less if it's a rural community. Uh, it's, it's possible in, such, in that size of a community through various kinds of dialogue process. I've, I've mentioned some schemes, some, some ideas, but they're just meant to be proposals, just first ideas that other people would improve on. But by various dialogue process, you can see how 3,000 people could 
together decide what their agenda is on an uh, ongoing basis and basically run their community completely democratically. Mm -hmm. And whatever elected officials they have would simply be carrying out the policies that the people have come up with. So there really wouldn't be any government at that level. There would be agencies that carried out the people's will, mm -hmm. but there wouldn't be any delegation of power at that small scale. And so I think localization of control, sovereignty, and e economy all go together. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean complete self-sufficiency or isolation or anything like that. It just means that becomes your unit of decision-making and your unit of economic optimization. So at that level, you decide, well, do we want to grow such and such ourselves, or do we want to trade, or did it, you know, what do we want to do? How do we want to develop our economy? Mm -hmm. becomes a democratic decision. Do you know of any examples of places that you would consider democratic? Well, basically, I'd say we have... We have not had any democracy for 6,000 years, period. And the whole world. Yeah. And, and this may come as a big shock to some people, but the one country I know of whose structure is the closest to what I would call a democratic process is in Cuba. Because in Cuba, the, each neighborhood, actually, at a, with a high participation rate, gets together, I guess, I don't know whether it's every year or every two years or something, they get together as, as a community, talk about all the issues, not just local issues, they talk about Cuba's issues, you know. And then they... They don't have competitive elections. They, they select a slate of candidates to go off and represent them. And these are just ordinary citizens, people with jobs. Mm -hmm. And they sort of get time off work with pay to go sit in the parliament, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the whole structure, but I mean, I've read reports by people who've gone there and observed it. And that was the basic structure is that at the local community level, they decide on policy and then send a slate to represent mm -hmm. that consensus. I think that sounds like uh, the, the kind of structure that also was in Eastern Europe and the, the Soviet Union, a democratic centralism, which certainly, I mean, people talk about how undemocratic uh, those countries were in the Soviet Union was, and that's true. But the structure wasn't undemocratic, <laughs> particularly. There's just, you have to be on constantly vigilant, seems to me. There's a a saying that uh, freedom is a constant struggle, and it certainly seems that way to me, because so far it seems like there's some kind of human uh, tendency <laughs> for corruption, I guess. Mm -hmm. At higher levels. Well, it's so dependent on the personality of Castro to kind of keep the, the spirit of the revolution alive and also to be the person who stands for Cuba on the international scene. So it's not clear that the process they have there is going to continue. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, Venezuela is another country which has a lot of stuff which are very democratic going on. Well, I've been to Cuba a few times. I haven't been to Venezuela. I was there once for a very short time, but I haven't been there recently. And I, it seems like uh, we're just both giving our impressions here. So I guess it can't be the, the last word, as if it, anything could be the last mm -hmm. word. But um, that the people have really jumped at the opportunity to take control of their own lives and to you know, do their best collectively to fill their, their needs their basic needs, and the government it helps that instead of hindering it. That, that's my impression, anyway, from the interviews and what, from what I know about Venezuela, and this is all very new and very exciting and wonderful, it seems to me. So we come back again to that, at least in my mind, to this issue of, of people taking responsibility. If we didn't mention that, I'd like to mention it, because it is very much the opposite of, oh, there's nothing we can do. We're powerless. I mean, that is an attitude that can't lead anywhere but to be true. Well, <laughs> yes, and it, there's also another different way to look at it, and that is that hopelessness is sometimes the root of new hope. In other words, and that's really what happened to me is that I kept being disillusioned. Like I looked at, well, what if we had better campaign financing? What if we had a third party? What if we had this? I kept going through all the various solutions that we all think of if we think about these things. And then I'd look at history and I'd find out, oh, my, they, tr they tried that. Wow, they had the biggest third party I've ever heard of, you know, around 1900, and it, it got co-opted. And they did a much better job than I could dream of any of us doing today. So it's like I kept seeing all these solutions that were tried and failed. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, and here we would disagree, and I'm not insulting you, but I would have said the Soviet Union failed in many ways. So 
I was left with hopelessness. I, I couldn't see any way that it ever tried. And then I began to see this whole radical democracy or real democracy began to emerge as I learned about uh, dialogue and people. And I learned about how indigenous societies all used consensus processes, dialogue processes to solve their problems. They're very egalitarian. So it's very natural for you. It's our primordial heritage. It's, it's the way we were raised as a species was to solve our problems through dialogue. And uh, civilization has conditioned us into thinking that we need the government to protect us from each other. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just conditioning. It, what we, we're quite capable of governing ourselves. We're quite capable of working together if we remember how to do it, uh, learn how to talk to each other again. And that's what facilitators can help us do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I guess we're coming back to the same place here because I agree. But it's and when I was talking about corruption setting in, it's when people stop taking uh, responsibility and stop having that dialogue, and and people can step in and take over. And that that's happened many, many times in many different kinds of systems. Yeah, there is no. I mean, you can create the perfect system, but then you still have human beings with their limitations. <laughs> well, as long as you set up a system where there are positions of power, then you're lost. There can be no positions of power if you want to have a democracy. And that's the hard problem is how do you structure a society so that there are no positions of power. And that's really what the book is about. And those who are familiar with anarchist literature would realize that, in some sense, it's just a version of anarchism. Anarchism means no hierarchy. And, of course, anarchism has a bad name and includes people that did things I wouldn't approve of, so I don't talk about anarchism and I don't use the word. But a lot of the ideas, basically, are just what democracy is. Mm-hmm. And it has a bad name partly because uh, of this uh, the matrix. <laughs> <laughs> this <yes>. media <laughs> that creates reality. <clears throat> and the name of your book, Richard Moore, is Escaping the Matrix, How We the People Can Change the World. So for one thing, we can sure start thinking critically. Yeah, well, I'm hoping enough people buy the book who are the kind of people who are going to get out there and start getting dialogue processes started in their communities, get their communities learning how to dialogue with themselves. That's really what it's about, so that the people can discover what their collective identity is. Mm -hmm. Because it's only by working together that we can change things. Individuals can't do it. I definitely agree with that. (laughs) (laughs) Going to take a bunch of us. Okay, so we want to let people know that your website, Richard Moore, is escapingthematrix.org. And you have another one as well. Yeah, that's cyberjournal.org. C-Y-B-E-R-J-O-U-R-N-A-L. Cyberjournal. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Do you have any other closing words? Well, Sue, thank you very much. I enjoyed this opportunity to talk with you and lovely Eugene. That American town, how they should be. (laughs) Yeah, it's a nice place. Okay, well, my name's Sue Supriano. And thanks to Richard Moore, and thank you for listening. To hear other programs produced by Sue Supriano, go to my website, www.suesupriano.com, spelled S-U-E-S-U-P-R-I-A-N-O. To order copies of my shows or to communicate with me, you can send me an email at sue at suesupriano.com. Again, Supriano is S-U-P-R-I-A-N-O. Thanks a lot. My name's Sue Supriano, and thanks to Richard Moore, and thank you for listening.